a lot of people on, right, so far? We always do a little housekeeping at Fifth and Wine where I beg for business and stuff first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not begging. Um, and I got my notes all typed awesome. up. To interview Mary tonight. Um, she's a really fun lady. We're gonna have a lot of fun tonight. And it's been fun for all of us anyway. Um, we've learned so much over this, uh, what, two weeks now? Mm -hmm. This is our third week. Third week. So um, it's been fun and, and entertaining and educational. And on Saturday night, I got a little carried away with the geekiness, according to my daughter and my wife. But I had like four <laughs> customers come in and say, Mark, you weren't geeky at all. We enjoyed it. So, <laughs> I think my daughter and my wife might be wrong. Anyway. Well, you know, we're our own worst critic, right? Exactly. <laughs> or your family is. <laughs> or your family is. <laughs> um, so we had a, a great special we tried today at Fifth and Wine for lunch. We made a sample, Tara will post it on Facebook, or maybe you already have. Not yet. Okay. Anyway, it's, uh, we took our bison that we buy from Cascade Meats, and we put some of our Eric's Wicked Bacon in it. And then for mm -hmm. uh, last week, if you guys tried the burger at um, Burger, no, what's it called? Uh, Road, Roadhouse, Roadhouse Diner. We made a, a red wine aioli out of a wine called the Sauce. And we put shallots and pepper and... Um, made our own aioli out of um, olive oil and we had fun with it. And so we're using that this week on that special. So you get three bison burger sliders, bison bacon burger sliders, uh, dressed with a greens and a herb, herb uh, marinated tomato um, for $13, I think. Yep. So we'll have that special tomorrow. Can you deliver to Walla Walla? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to jump on the next plane heading to Walla Walla. <laughs> or drive, I guess. Right, I'd rather drive at this point. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. And then uh, we have, I think, about 37 people this week on our wine tasting, um, virtual wine tasting. And again, thanks for all the support. That really helps pay bills. Um, and we sold, so we sold uh, 37 bottles of of Mary's wine and we have another case. Yeah, we have another case sitting in our uh, our store right now. When you love this wine, like we all do at the end of this, you come on down and support Fifth and Wine and Mary and even Eagle. So Eagle Distributing is owned by my wife's family and she and Heather are have done every one of these wines so far. I haven't used another distributor, so don't tell the other distributors because they'll all be mad at me. But I told him today that I was probably going to change the name of our business again to um, Eagle Retail. Because <laughs> that's, all, that's all we seem to sell right now is Eagle. But that helps pay the bills doubly, so it's good, right? All good. <laughs> all right, so I kind of want to just talk a little bit first, Mary, before we go into the Q&A. Okay. The first time I went to – I tried to get to Walla Walla for like three years in a row. And the first year, like, it was a major snowstorm and we couldn't get past – you know, all those passes and drive down. Cause you have to go over, you know, Rogers and then. It's, that could be nasty. And whatever, all those, 4th of July. Oh, so we just gave, gave up. The second year, my car broke down on Rogers Pass. I had to get it, I had to get it sold back to Great Falls. So we didn't make it. So yes. finally the third year we made it and we were just having fun. And I didn't really set up a ton of wine tastings. I think we maybe had six, five or six. And we were just wandering around downtown Walla Walla. And this is your previous tasting room, Mary. Before mm -hmm. the and we just happened to walk in and Mary was so accommodating, so fun and so cheerful and made such great wine. So that's my first experience with Mary. And then we visited again and, and, and went to her new tasting room. And then she, a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, I don't remember anymore. Three, but three. yeah. So they do a thing just like Pinot Camp in Oregon. It's called Walla Walla Experience. Is that right, Mary? Um, W2U, but yeah, Walla Walla Wine Experience. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, just, it's pretty much, hi Hazel. Hi Hazel. Oh, look at that cutie. <laughs> it's pretty much just like um, the Pinot Camp was in Oregon. Only a lot smaller. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's, how yeah, many were there, like 30 or something? 40? There was only um, 20 candidates and about 20 wineries, 20, 25 wineries. So we, it was really fun because you got such intimate um, exposure to, like I got to ride around in the pickup truck with Roger, is it uh, McGibbons from, uh, from Pepperbridge. Norm, Norm McKibben. Norm McKibben yeah. right. So I get like, right around the front seat of his pickup like, truck. He's the grand poopa. You know right. what I mean? 
He's like, bow down to Norm. I love that man. Love, love, love. One of love the that. interesting things of that is that in Walla Walla, it's much different than other wine country I've been to. You travel around wheat fields, basically, and then you yeah. all of a sudden you come to a south facing slope that is just covered in vines. And Norm, like, we would go bouncing across, you know, like a Montana prairie, it felt like. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you're just in this vineyard and not a lot, at least back then, not a lot of wineries are even located necessarily right where the vineyards are. So, you know, it's kind of, that was fun. And then we got to go to Leonetti's Cellars. If you guys know Leonetti's Cellars, that is, that is the grand poop pile of all the wineries there. Right, yeah, they, yeah. They have, we... gated, they have a gated entrance with big paved roads. Mm -hmm. And we got to meet Chris Figgins and taste wine with him, who's the son of the original Gary Figgins. Um, is one of the original, what, three, isn't it? Woodward well, Hanson. it was, yeah, Gary and, um, um, Casey from Seven Hills and um, um, Rick Small from Woodward Canyon. You know, you know, those are the three big guys. And then it kind of slowly grew to Walla Walla Vintners um, uh, from and them. Cole to was in there, right? Cole and, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so it was, just, it was really cool. So Leonetti, like I, I only get about two six packs a year of that in my market. And, and we got to actually drive into this beautiful winery and go through the gate and they actually let me through which I was always kind of surprising. <laughs> which is really surprising no <laughs> uh, and i bet there was 25 big cabs sitting around uh from uh, from mary was there and you know whatever all the big cab and and cab blends and you know just it was an amazing experience the whole the whole weekend was an amazing experience uh, well, good. I mean, that's um, that program, which I'm still a part of and orchestrates uh, the whole uh, um, three day weekend for people that come in. Uh, you know, it's really something that we take pride. I take pride in being a part of to helping um, you, you know, wine buyers from, you know, whether you're a restaurateur or a retail space to really come in and get one-on-one -on -one with the winemakers to walk around the vineyards and get to see what is really happening here and touch and feel and talk and laugh and and get to know us as people and and our stylistically what we're doing differently within the wineries and you know because many of us buy you know grapes from seven hills or the rocks or heather hill and you know so you get all these same vineyards that are in within walla walla but we all have our own different styles that um I, you know, that we hope that show through when um, you get to come and do these big, you know, these tastings like this and, and, and you sit in the truck, you sit in an old truck and drive, as you say, drive through a wheat field, like, where the hell are we going? And then all of a sudden, boom, you're in Seven Hills or you're out at Spring Valley. And, um, you know, it's, it's very near and dear to my heart to keep this program going along with um, Rick Small. Mary, and Mary, remember we talked about no swear words. Oh, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> well, <you know. laughs> and then one other story real quick, and then we'll get into kind of you. Tara, my, my daughter, and Jacob, my son, and I went on a, we used to take every January off the first week, well, the whole month, basically, because we were slow. But we always took closed to different wine regions. One time we went to Walla Walla for that first week in January, and we had so much fun. But we were sitting at, there's a tapas restaurant there. What's it called, Mary? Can you remember? Um, were you at Saffron? Yeah, Saffron. So we're sitting at Saffron, just the three of us. We we're by ourselves. And we were talking just amongst ourselves. And the server comes up and said, and Jake was in the middle of talking. He's like, I don't think my palate can take any more of this. My palate is so tired. And the waitress said, the server said, that's a real first world problem you have there, son. So <laughs> it really is kind of fun when you go, funny when you go to Walla Walla, eventually at the end, you want a beer or you want a cocktail because it's, it's full of it, big, rich red wines. So. Right. And uh, Saffron definitely has some good cocktails, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, why don't you, can you just tell us, your website is very um, well done. And Oh, well, thank you. I always wonder. What I really, um, can you tell the story just about how, you know, the restaurant scene that you were in and, and the whole thing, how you ended up I'll give a quick Walla Walla. little, um, well, I've been here in Walla Walla for 20 years. I moved here in 2000. Um, I'd been before that and lived in Chicago and San Francisco working at um, some high-end restaurants from Zuni Cafe to Stars with Jeremiah Towers, Judy Rogers with Zuni. And then in Chicago, I worked with um, 
Oh my goodness. Um, another big, and now I can't, now I'm slipping my head. Um, um, spruce and now it had been in the scene for I you know so many years um, also was a trained opera singer so that was where my goal was to become you know Lentin Price um, and uh, but worked you know kept my you know funding myself through the uh, restaurant industry but grew you know definitely had a, a passion with food and wine and started really paying attention and um, developing my palate Brian Duncan who became one of my mentors when I was with in Chicago and at that time this is like in 1997 98 and there wasn't there wasn't that many women in the industry as far as um wine buyers and uh, or psalms and um even I even I never thought about really going that direction because it didn't really matter at that time nobody was you know nobody was tooting their horn about oh I've got my psalm badge you know, you, you just do what you do. You had a job. And that's what I kind of fell into. And, um, and my mentor at that time is like, Mary, you know, you just, you, you don't need to have the paper. You just, you know, you, you, you're passionate. You have a great palate. You just go that direction. And you don't have to always do what you think is the norm. Um, so did that. And then um, my husband and I moved out here in 2000 to help start up Spring Valley Vineyard. Uh, which was a family owned um, old farm that had been uh, a wheat farm for a number of, you know, few generations. And my father-in-law started growing, started to decide that to branch out from wheat and started planting. And they kind of threw that, you know, carrot at us. Do you want to move out to Walla Walla? And uh, at that time it was, I had been out to Walla Walla a couple of times and, and the last time before we were visiting in 1990 or 90, like in May of 2000. I was like, I will never move here, Devin. What are we going to do out here? We're not farmers, you know, but never say never because it usually bites you in the butt, right? So of uh, May of 2000, we came out here. I was like five months pregnant. And at that point, I'm like, oh, things are happening here in Walla Walla. I met Christophe Baron, Eric, uh, Dunham from Dunham Cellars and Charles Smith, who now are all, you know, have been lifelong friends. Um, and I, all of a sudden I realized like there's something going on here in Walla Walla, even though it's the year of 2000 and there's probably what, maybe 20 some wineries. Um, and, but at that point I told Devin like, we'll buy a house in Seattle and we'll commute. I didn't realize what that commute would be like. <laughs> so we moved out here. We did buy a place here in Walla Walla. Uh, raised my son, who is now 19 and a Marine. Um, and I my, lost my husband in a car accident in 04. Um, took time off. Had a great community that kind of wrapped their arms around me. And kind of I helped me out when I wasn't sure if I was going to stay or if I was, you know, continuing the business. and. Then in 07, um, I met my original business partner um, that had gone through the Enology program and we kind of joined forces and started Dama. And Dama meeting lady uh, or woman, woman in Spanish that was just like, oh, perfect. We're two ladies, let's get this going. Um, so we, you know, we started off pretty small. We can't, you know, we, our first year or so, first, Vintage was, uh, I was working with John Abbott with the Beha, and um, he helped me make, so, you know, kind of the first actually two vintages helping us really get on board and make, helping us make our cabs and our, our Chardonnay. And then after that, we kind of started, grow, you know, branching out on our own. Um, isn't, that really, isn't he another really kind of a famous winemaker in Walla Walla? Oh, John, yeah, John is, uh, you know, he's no longer with the Beha. He started his own. Um, small winery called Devona. He is one of my, you know, favorite, favorite guys in this industry. And there's, a, there's a number of them, but he is like definitely um, top notch, top notch human being funnier than all get out and smart and uh, talented and generous. I remember uh, his Chardonnay being just amazing in a Bay House. I was, I was, yeah, I've always loved his Chardonnay. Uh, so, um, and so the last nine years, I've been making my wine at Artifacts, which is a co-op. So it houses about, I'd say about 15 different wineries. 
but we're all responsible for bringing in our own fruit, our you know our own barrels, our own winemaking style. We just share the the facility and the staff. So if I'm not there, if I'm like out in the vineyard and, and checking on fruit, but yet I've got fruit already in and processed that needs to be punched down. I, you know, it's just like somebody, some 20 year old can do the punch down. I don't need to do that any longer to tell you the truth, <laughs> but <laughs> unless I want a good workout, but you know, there's so I love it that it's um, especially during harvest when we're all kind of in and out and exchanging what's going on. Like, what are you bringing in today? Um, how's it, you know, what's it looking like in the vineyards that you're working with too? You know, oh my, you know, I've got slow going over here. So it's always like this wonderful exchange of information um, and camaraderie that, you know, I guess that has always been a part of my my being as far as being a, a singer and being in, in theater and in choir, it's like always been this group effort in ways and uh, of, you know, creating something. And um, I find that very, I mean, th I love that. Not everybody likes that kind of style of working, working environment, but um, they have a really great staff there. The business is uh, owned by, um, Norm McKibben and J.F. Francois from uh, Pile from um, uh, from uh, Pepper Bridge, and a couple, and then a Cataretta Winery as well. So it's a great group, and they've got. And actually, the last few years has been more and more women in the industry in that end, and more women hey, like kind hey, of running the Mary, show. Mary, Mary, you're completely oh. stealing all of my interview notes. Oh my! I'm not. You got to tell me to shut up because I would just go on. <laughs> So here's, here's the next question. You were one of the first female <laughs> winemakers in Walla Walla, right? Tell us about female winemaking, please. Um, <laughs> just joking around. You know that, right? No, no. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because, I'll, uh, you know, it's not like all of a sudden we appeared. I mean, there's been women winemakers out there for a frickin' long time. Yeah. Um, and, but... Uh, I mean, so when I started that, you know, here in Walla Walla, there was only maybe five or six of us, you know, from Holly Turner, from Three Rivers, to Marie Eve at Forgeron. Um, no, I can't, you know, yeah, there was only a handful. Now, because we have the wine program here in Walla Walla, uh, we're definitely seeing more and more women in the, in the nets, you know, the grits of it, um, from, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I can, you know, now my, my mind kind of forgets who, but we've got a number of women out there that are making wine in the trenches. And I love seeing that. I think it's, um, but you know, it's interesting because, um, I mean, I've been, you know, over this period of my life now with Dama, I've been a single mom and raising my son on my own to a business owner to kind of juggling a lot. Um, and it's not easy. And I'm not going, oh, poor me, because I, I don't like that. But it's, you know, I don't know um, if the guys understand how difficult it is as a woman in this industry as it is on whatever level um, to, you know, just then to be a single mom in the industry and trying to just like navigate it all. Um, and t being taken seriously in the industry. Um, so, I mean, I think things are changing, um, but it's still at times, um, like why, why does it matter if I'm a woman winemaker? It should be, you're just a winemaker, I know. I remember talking to Norm McGibbon about this, about you, and he said he, you have a very well-respected palate in Walla Walla that people will actually um, ask you to taste their blends and things like that. So. I think you've got a ton of respect out there. And then well, also, one of our well, one of our uh, guys wants to know if you'll sing at the end some opera. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I don't know about that. Maybe after a couple glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, for for Norm to say that 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 makes my heart sing, because I so respect him. You know. So one of the things I we talked about with other with, that's my that's my dog, he's a yapper. Anyway, one of the things we talked about with other winemakers was kind of the transition from whatever you did previously in life to doing 
this winemaking or being in the wine business. And do you see any parallels kind of between, you know, being a foodie and cooking and, and all of that? And Oh my, of and course, wine. it is all so intertwined. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I, it dawned on me a couple of years ago as a, um, associating my singing world and who I am and what I wanted to achieve as far as that, that perfect note, if you will. So there's an Italian word called squillo. And so if you, if you hear, you know, if you go to a, a, perf a live performance and you, and the choir, the person stops singing, but you hear this vibration continuing on because it's such a pure, beautiful note. That's what I want in my wines. I want that vibration of continue. Because as, as a singer, it's like when it's that vocal sound that because it's coming from your body, your soul, and then I'm em emoting it out to you, and you're accepting that vibration, and then you're kind of bringing it back to me. And to me, that's like that is exactly what wine is about, you know. And then you add, you know, then you add new nuances of you know, what it is, what is it like to um, experience food and wine together? What's it like to experience food or wine with who you're with? Or, you know, I mean, these are all so integrated. I just, you know, I think yeah. that's what yeah. is so beautiful, beautiful about um, embracing food and wine and music. There's no right or wrong answers to me. When I get people coming in going, oh, I don't know. I can't smell anything. I can't taste. I don't know what you're talking about. I go, I'm not asking for any right or wrong answers here. You know, it's all subjective. And what you, I taste or smell is going to be different from you. And that's okay. And I, you know, it's like, you have to think about maybe what brings, you know, comes up in your memory of like, oh, that does smell like my grandfather's old sweater. And I kind of love it, you know, or you don't like it. I mean, but these are things that people are afraid to vocalize because they think that there should be just a set, answer to what wine should taste like what you know and there isn't i mean there, i mean there is and there isn't you know what i'm saying i've got a uh, story about that first time i was in burgundy probably well 2002 i think it was we went in burgundy if you're not aware of the wine scene in the world that's probably the most it's it would be like going to mecca for Muslims. right it, yeah it's 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 the holy land of, of wine and they they're very serious about their wine and they're kind of intimidating. I've been there three times now. And they're, they, they accept outsiders, but they're a very close-knit um, community. And the first time we went, this guy, we rented a VRBO from a guy uh, from Canada. He sent us, he said, this, this guy really likes Americans. Go to his winery. And so we go there. His name is Joel. I'll never forget him. And so he spoke good English because we don't speak any French. And the same thing happened there. He poured this beautiful bottle, I mean, just bottle of Pinot Noir into my glass. And then he looks at me, he's like, do you like it? I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to answer this. Like I'm intimidated right. about answering it even, right? And, and so he finally says, just tell me what you think of it. You don't have to like it. I didn't make it. I'm just selling it. You know, it, it's up to you if you like it or don't like it. But then his lecture afterwards was, but you can all, you always have to try new things. You can't get stuck on one wine. And so I think that's, so, you know, I think that's true. We get, you know, all of us that, that we're learning from all this. And it's fun. It's it's ever um, evolving and changing. I mean, you know, from one vintage to the next, to one vineyard to the other vineyard. I mean, you could taste as you did, you know, when you were here a few years ago with, you know, the different Merlot, you know, the tastings that we did at W2U, and you kind of go, oh, this is a whole lineup of Merlot, but they're from, you know, how many different vineyard sites that may only be, you know, two miles away from each other, or ten miles, or and. And it's like those nuances are so particular and beautiful if you, you know, to experience. That's a good segue into what we're going to talk about next, which is where so I think it's fairly common. You'll have to tell me, but I, I thought it was fairly common in Washington compared to other places that I've been where you have people that just grow grapes and people that just make wine. Not necessarily always that it's the guy or the woman who grows the grapes or the guy or the woman who makes the wine. Like you don't have any vineyards that are, that you own. You go out we, and you choose and how do you choose them and whatever. Um, well, I don't own any vineyards right now. My business partner has some land that we are thinking about planting. Um, 
maybe next year or the year after. Um, but I guess over, the, I mean, I've been here for, you know, as I say, 20 years, I've been, you know, I've, I've tasted out enough different vineyard designate um, wines that um, I kind of, and that, you know, I kind of like know where I want to search out. And sometimes it's about the price point as far as how much they're charging me per tonnage to more, you know, more, you know, more, usually it's like my relationship with that person that's dealing, that's growing in, uh, the vigneron, you know, um, and I've been lucky to deal with some really great vineyard people, whether it's Sadie Dury out of Seven Hills. I mean, she's, she's amazing. I love working with her. Um, and to, why, do you love, why do you love working with her? I mean, what's the, I, I don't know, you know, um, I think that we're kind of the same mindset to not, um, uh, she pays attention to what I want personally out of my rose. And so, and she has to, and then I think about, she does that probably with every winemaker that comes in. And so I love that she's like, okay, what, you know, what kind of, what are you looking for with your Merlot? What do you want? And so she, it's not just about her ego. It's about what I can do the best for what style of wine you want to make. And so it's that conversation an understanding of you know what of what what I want as a winemaker and such so and not everybody's like that um but I love that I have that relationship with her Scott uh uh Chris Bannock that uh works with XL Vineyard that's and seven and um Heather Hill that's in that whole area of seven hills he's really uh, you know old school but really great to work with um and a lot of times, it might, a lot of these are just handshakes. I mean, I have contracts out with these guys, but then a couple of my other uh, vineyards, it's kind of just a, it's a handshake, if you will, which I kind of like. On your website, it talks about that you get different um, tastes and, you know, kind of the terroir of these vineyards. Some are more tannic, some are more fruit driven, right? Is that in, in two, <laughs> Oh, most definitely. Like my, uh, my cab out of Heaven Hill that I, that I, um, solely do 100% cab, um, that has such beautiful structure and, and great tannins, but also just really voluptuous fruit that I just love. Um, I had bought a couple of years ago um, some um, cab and some Tempranillo out of Lake Colleen, and oh my God, it was like night and day, like just monster tannins. Like my Tempranillo is still, it's a, um, 2000, I still have it in barrel. It's in 2017 that I'll, I'll probably barrel this um, coming uh, fall, but it's a monster. And I, I've never, I've never dealt with that kind of tannin structure before. So it's been, that was kind of a nice, a fun learning curve for me. One of the things that we talk about is people that aren't in your, your guys' business is blending. And I know this, this is a big deal to me. It's like a, a chef um, putting together pepper and whatever, all the spices. Right. Tell us about, do you do your own blending by yourself or do you have other people help or and then kind um, of the process of why you decide 5% Cabernet Franc is needed or whatever? Um, I do have, I have an assistant that works with me. So we usually, I don't like to have too many people, too many cooks in the kitchen when I get, to, when it gets down to that moment of doing blends. Um, I'll bring in my business partner, like when I'm 99% sure that what the blend is going to be, but Joel and I will work, you know, we'll spend an afternoon, like my collage, which is my Merlot blend. We'll kind of go through different scenarios. I know that I want it X amount Merlot, but then how much cab do I want? How much cab front do I want? Um, so that, you know, that's, I, and we'll go banter back and forth and, you know, I'll say well, what, what is the what is the process of what's Cab Franc ad? What is Merlot ad? What is you know? Well, so um, my with the collage, I've got the Seven Hills Merlot, which is always like big, big juicy fruit. Um, the Heather Hill Cab kind of rounds it out, brings a little more you know a little more tannin and structure to it. And then that Cab Franc, I just I love that it just brings like this dark violet fruit to it. And I, I only use like five to 7% usually in that blend. Um, I don't know, it kind of changes like this past my, 
2015 collage that I'm on now has more, it um, has a little more cab than my 14 did. So it's more, it's almost even with it being more low in cab and then just a touch of a, uh, of a, uh, of a, uh, uh, cap franc but That's it's all based I, on the palette? I know, you, know, you know at the end of the day i get it in, you know i cross my fingers and go i think i like you know i like this blend i you know i think it's gonna work let's get it in bottle and yeah and cross your fingers i know it's not gonna be a flawed wine but you know it evolve even after when it's bottled it takes I don't know how many months you know i mean it all depends what wine it is whether it goes to this dumb stage and you like drink it and go oh my god what did i do but it's just in this, it shuts down after it's been filtered and bottled and it's kind of, it's not the wine that you expected it to be until, you know, maybe two, three, four months down the road and all of a sudden it starts coming together and you go, oh, there it is, <laughs> you know. One of the, uh, one of the other things we talked about a lot in the wine world is the oak program. Beautiful. You know, like, uh, and some people use a lot of new oak, new oak, some people, which is very expensive and some people use very little. Right. Some people do completely neutral, no oak, uh, even on red. So what's kind of your story there? When, what's the um, it all depends on what wine it is. Like my Grenache, I don't use any new oak. It's all neutral barrels. My, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, my, uh, so then my Cab, my Cab Franc bottling, my Cab, my um, Collage are kind of that, 60% new, 40% um, one and two year old barrels. And then I've gotten onto this company that will, um, it's called, it's a, it, the name of the company is called Nucor. And I can give him, I can give the company like two to three year old barrels and they'll come in and they'll take the barrels and they'll shave the inside of the barrels just slightly. And then I, and so they're kind of almost reprocessed so that I, they come back to me and they're almost like a new brand new barrel. So I get a little more um, oak out of like a three year old barrel that would be pretty mm. neutral. Um, and I've been working with this company now for three years. I gotta tell you, I love it. It saves me money. And uh, what do you think oak adds uh, to your wines when you use new oak and, and neutral oak? I mean, what is the, what is the flavor? Well, you, get tannins, out of you get tannins from the new, from oak. You get, you know, you uh, you get that caramely, you know, quality. You get that vanilla, and I mean, it all depends what type of oak it is. If, if it's a, a Hungarian oak or Minnesota, you know, oak from the U.S. And if I use a Minnesota oak or a, um, a a United States oak, I usually use that for my Tempranillo more than any other. Um, I don't use American oak on any other wine than my Tempranillo, but. Um, um, you know, French oak is much more tighter grain than our American oak. And so, and it brings more tannin to the structure. And I love, I love that. Um, so I'm looking for different, you know, when, at the end of the day, what, you know, especially my calves and Merlot, if it's bringing up some depth to it, it just adds another layer. But I don't want it, I don't want my, I don't want like my cab or my low to be 100% new oak. One, I can't, yeah, just to me that overwhelms, takes over the fruit. So we, um, obviously you're a foodie, you've been around the food world. And one of the fun things about Walla Walla is it's a pretty good food scene for, how big are I you now? Know. Are you guys 25,000, 30,000, 50,000? How big are, no, is Walla Walla like now? Thousand. How many? 35. Yeah. And I'll bet you have um, 10 great restaurants. Pretty close to that, you know, from yeah. Saffron to T-Max to, um, yeah, t um, Hathaway's is a new restaurant oh, since that. you've been here. It's kind of crazy. Our little tiny little community has so many great restaurants, yeah, uh, which kinda, I can't wait for them to be open again. I can't yeah, wait to go get a cocktail. Really, yeah, you guys really have come a long ways, even in the 10 years since I've been coming there. So yeah. just, just to talk about food, so here's what we've got so far. We have uh, beef tenderloin, twice baked potatoes, corn on the cob. That's a good Montana meal. Pear oh, yeah. Bite, a dragon Which chicken and sauteed Brussels sprouts. A spicy teriyaki sauce is the dragon chicken. And then uh, braised beef plate ribs. Ah, oh, so, I'm hungry. Beef skillet, um, Belgium chocolate and nuts. So we're all over the board tonight on what we're enjoying with your Cabernet. What well, would you think you would put 
If you were to open one of these tonight, what would you cook or order? I'd probably be on the grill. Uh, you know, I, I love having any grilled burger steak. I think it's like perfect. Anything, you know, that grilled charredness, I think is just yummy. And so especially, um, I think some of the richness out of a steak just kind of just goes so beautifully with uh, the cab here. I agree. So tell us about Cowgirl Cab, how you came up with the name or... Oh, I know. Also, maybe just talk know, about if it's 100% cab. Just tell us the story of, of, of Cowgirl. Uh, well, one, one, it is not 100% cab. Um, it is a little over 80%. And then I've got a little Merlot and there's a, a touch of Syrah. I think there's only like maybe 4% Syrah in it. Um, I just wanted that to kind of bring out a little spiciness to it. Um, and it's about 40% new oak. I did use um, some state um, oak staves in it to just kind of bring out a little bit more uh, oak program. Um, and it was in, I think it was in barrel for about 24 months before I bottled it. I'll be actually, I was supposed to bottle up the new vintage here, but I'm holding off now till we get through this period. Um, but um, so Cowgirl Cab came, it was just one of those fluke moments where I'm out um, with my, with a friend who's a photographer and he was uh, my first business partner and I were out in the vineyards and we're just kicking up dust and doing photographs. And, and after the end of the day, we're looking at them and it's like, oh my God, I love this picture of the two of us. Like, it's, not, it's not like I want to be on a label, but it was like, you know, kind of girl power, cowgirl power. And then he's like, well, let's just call it cowgirl cab. And I'm like, oh my God, we're, we're all over this. So, <laughs> you know. Well, that is... Just so you know, that ends up in Glacier National Park every summer, and it's a pretty good seller up there. They like the word cowgirl cab when they're Right, who doesn't love a good cowgirl? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, I do, and I do ride horses, so, you know, I'm not a fake cowgirl. <laughs> so somebody asked how you decide 40% new elk or 60% or 20%. I mean, is that just vintage to vintage based on the harvest? It kind of changes. It, I mean, it depends. Um, once everything gets to fermentation, like so, I, the, you know, I already start in my head when I'm bringing in fruit. I'm kind of going, okay, I know I'm bringing in ten tons of cab. I need to be prepared for, you know, how many, you know, what that means in barrel size. You know, what I'm going to be bringing in. You know, what I need for barrels. And so, you know, I'm already by this time. You know, by midsummer here, if not sooner, I've got to make some big barrel selections and what's going to happen for this coming year. And um, so I look at, you know, what I have that is, empty. you know, I just bottled a couple months ago. So I've got X amount of, new, I don't want to say neutral barrels. There's a couple one and two year old barrels to three year old barrels. And so I look at that and go, okay, I've got X amount there. And how much more um, new barrels do I want for my cab and for my Merlot and my Cab Franc? Those are the three wines that I kind of pay attention to as far as where I want to go with them. Um, with so new explain barrels. neutral barrels. So after what is it about five years where there's no? I would say really after about three years, you're not really you're not getting that much. And I like you know you just I like having you know you, you, I don't want to have it be a, a hundred percent new oak. So I like having it in a, you know a neutral vessel. So one of these years when I make a little more, more money, I'll get one of those big eggs, you know those cement eggs. But maybe next year. That's what I well, mean. if people buy enough tonight, maybe we... Right? Come on, support right on. I want to get an egg this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Send me an egg other... for Easter. Yeah. <laughs> One of the other questions we always ask, and I think most winemakers or most people that have been on with us have not been... Um, they, we ask them what they get in aromas and they get in taste, and they always say... Well, that's up to the individual, but we're asking you as an individual. What are you? What are you tasting? Are you on this cab right now? I am. I got it in my what are you glass. Tasting and what are the aromas you get, and you know, kind of the I texture. I get that. You know, I mean, I still get a lot of that kind of meaty charcoal. You know that. Um, I mean, I, I, I smell. I mean, I get like if there's that steak right on the grill. I get that kind of beefy quality right now. I get a lot of. Um, uh, dried cherry fruit right now as well like not and not being I mean it's really I feel like it's really you know that really dried intense cherry quality Almost like a Chianti yeah yeah 
Yeah, it's got that kind of earthiness to it. Um, and texture is pretty interesting. I think it's 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 got some good tannin to it. It's still got it's still pretty lively. I gotta say, mm -hmm. I love. I mean, I love. It's got some good tannins going on. Yeah, it's great. That's why, like, now I want uh, now I want a steak. <laughs> Too bad there wasn't a restaurant open there. <laughs> right. So let's talk about other wines you make. We we uh, carry some in our store. I know you make a rosé that you were showing. Us oh, earlier. I'm so excited! Okay, so here's my my rosé. Very light. Um, I've been doing a Cap Franc rosé now for I think this is my fourth vintage. I get um, um, it's out of Prosser. The vineyard is Chendemille. Um, I love this vineyard because it's cropped really high. Um, it's always great acidity. Um, it's machine picked and, and then it's crushed right then and there. It sits in that, in the bin for, till I come and pick it up, bring it here. So, and then it probably sits on its skins for maybe eight hours before I press it out. Um, I love that it's, this year it's- Do you still see that category growing? What's that? Do you still see that category growing? Is rosé still hot like it has been? It's still hot, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of rosés out there right now. We're kind of inundated, but um, I don't know. I, 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 I drink rosé all year round. Yeah, I do too. You know? uh, we also, have, we also se have a Sauvignon Blanc in the market. I know, about, I know we have that. Can you tell us where that fruit is from? And that um, is also from the Luke Slopes, 100% um, Sauv Blanc. It was, um, it's pretty, there's a, t actually, no, it's not a, there's a little bit of Semillon. I think there's like maybe 5% five five or 7% Semillon, if I remember right. Um, I, it's lush. It's, it's a, a big Sauv Blanc. It's almost like a Chardonnay Sauv Blanc, if you ask me. It's got that richness, that kind of tropical fruit, but really great acidity. It's a good, it's a, again, like a really great food wine, but a great sipping wine. Yeah. And that's kind of my, my whole entity with, or the idea behind the, the cow, cowgirl wines, whether it's the Blanc or the Red, is that they're, they're just, you know, they're meant to be just, oh, you come home from work, I just want a glass of wine, I want to sit down, I don't want to have to think about it too much, and how, you know, not have to spend a fortune, but I want to have a nice, good wine. And both of these wines, kind of, that's what I've always tr strived to really make a complimentary wine that's going to not break your bank, but you can come home and go, oh, that was a good glass of wine, you know. So one, one of the things we talk about is quite a few of us on this call, I think, have been to Walla Walla um, and, and done the wine scene and the food scene. It's fun. But I know you guys have opening weekends and harvest parties and festivals. And can you tell us maybe some good times after we get through this that it would be a good time to visit Walla Walla? And, and well, you know, you? Um, we have Celebrate Walla Walla that comes. Um, I'm on the wine, uh, the wine Alliance board. I'm one of the, the marketing director for the Wine Alliance. And, um, you know, we're in a little bit of a, a flux here of what's going on now because our spring, our spring release weekend has also been canceled which is, you know, a big change up. But we have Celebrate Walla Walla, and each year we um, focus on a different varietal, and this year is Syrah. So, um, and we bring in uh, different winemakers from around the country. So we have a panel of, I think it's about five people, three, three of which are from Walla Walla. And so, you do, and so Christophe Baron from Cayuse will be on the panel. Um, um, who else is on there? Um, Trey Bush from Sleight of Hands from Walla Walla be on the panel. And then we have a guy from Australia and um, somebody from California and somebody from Bordeaux, or not Bordeaux, but um, Cotteron area. Um, so it's a, it's a really great way to kind of experience Syrah or whatever varietal is being focused um, that year, but this year it's Syrah and the great panel to different tastings for the weekend. And that is, I think that is July 16th. So that's like a three day event going on. Um, and then there's um, the fall, I think our, our fair weekend, we've got a fun, oh, oh my God, we got Chicago. You know the band Chicago? Shit, yeah, they're playing yeah, here. I'm old, I'm old enough to know that. Yes, you should know. <laughs> Me too. Um, 
So they're going to be here, I think, the end, sometime in August. Oh, fun. Woo! 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 Oh, very fun. <laughs> You'll have to go look. I don't know exact date, but that'll be fun. You know, we got our rodeo. Um, and then the fall, we have our fall release in, uh, in uh, first weekend of November. Um, we just want this whole ordeal to be done with, you know, and that everybody gets out of this safely and healthy and we can get back to whatever our new normal is going to be, which I don't know what that means yet, but I want my tasting room to be open. I want people to be here downtown. It's so awful not having people downtown. So Mary, one last thing, if you want to just kind of walk around the, the oh. uh, tasting room and show us that and then if anybody has any final questions for Mary while she's I'm doing gonna, it. I'm gonna, let's see, how do I, I don't know how I switch this. I was gonna try to do a. I think it's upper left. Upper you, left. Yeah, you can just do a switch around or you can just turn your phone around. Well, then you can't see it, I guess. I'm trying to, yeah, right. Hold on, let me see if I can do this. Well, Damn it, we should Well, anyway, well, okay, so I'm just gonna, okay. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna pretend I'm walking through the front door. So you're walking through the front door. Well, that's behind me. Oh, boom. Okay, there's my bar right behind me. So that's where, you know, you'd sit and have a glass, or stand and have a little glass of wine there. Or then I've got all this great seating space here, which I love. Um, and then obviously I have, um, let's see, then we have upstairs, which I usually have art going on. Um, every other month we have art, an artist showing, but um, we had to cancel that. Um, so let's see. We've got, let's say on this side, I've got a table here. People can hang out. Oh, there's my vintage surfboard. See my cute surfboard? Love her. Um, then you this still have the original brick um, with the with the. Yeah, this is I, yeah. So also we usually we have art all over here, uh, down you know, um, and then bum 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 bum. Um, I have a great seating area for dinner right here. So you're looking over Main Street. So I've got uh, one big long table and then you'll see. Yeah, there it is. There it is. The ref it's, a, it's a ghost, so oh, I can't get it right. It says refreshing and delicious. It's an old Coca Cola sign that was actually on the building next door that's no longer there. So um, we kind of found, you know, we, you know, when the guys started working on the building, we the bricks were missing. I'm like, what's behind that? And like, oh my goodness, it's a whole old Coca-Cola sign. Um, so yeah, I love our space. It's um, definitely more room than really, really need. But, um, you know, we've got old, I mean, this is the uh, woodwork, as you can see. And you guys will appreciate, you know, all the beams here that you just, you don't see that being, you know, in new buildings any longer to the original skylights. Um, I know, I love all the old, um, the oldness and the new and, you know, kind of industrial, but not too heavy. Uh, and then I'll just show you my um, one last, I'll kind of, so, I don't know if you can see. Bum, bum, bum. Right now I'm gonna, I can't do this. Can I do this? I don't know. Okay, so, can you, <laughs> I'm very bad, I'm sorry. So, that doesn't, that's not a very good shot. Hold on, I gotta figure out how to do that. Okay, so you can see my labels there, which I've um, been lucky enough to have some really great friends that are artists. So from this one, this little fun little piece here is a good friend of mine that she did that for me. Another gal from, um, that's my Cab Franc label. Um, she's, uh, she, Amy is a Psalm out of Chicago. Um, my other good friend did that for my Chardonnay. Um, Devin, my late husband was a photographer for it. So that's one of his labels. That's my Tempranillo label. Um, and then I got to show, okay, so hold on, hold on, hold the horses. Maybe you could sing some opera while you're doing this. Um, so my, <laughs> okay, I'll show you what, one last, my two new Syrah labels. Oh, fucking love them. Oh, I swore. Um, 
So can you see that? That is that is Hercules. He's going to be on my stony vine on the rock Syrah. And then this is Venus. She's there. So these were photos that I took when I was in Amsterdam last year um, and ran into the Hermitage Museum. And they're all the statues of of all the gods and goddesses and I just took you know just like oh this looks great I'll take a photo and then they ended up being so good I don't even know how I did it um but now they're gonna be lit now they're labels and so those are those Syrahs will come out um this fall so I'm excited I know we're, we're getting kind of long and you guys know, check sorry. out no if you guys check out if you want but you got to talk about in the rocks ABA for like oh, a okay, minutes, then we'll be done um, well, the, the Rocks now, it's its own AVA, which happened a few couple years ago. Um, it was basically an apple orchard. Um, and Christophe Baron, uh, how do we, 15 or so years ago, um, maybe more than that, actually, um, decided to start, they bought this land, tore up all these apple orchards, and started planting. And everybody thought he was crazier than Get Out. You know, crazy French guy, what is he doing? Well, now it's like, you know, it's uh, it's become this phenomenon that um, it, it's unbelievable minerality to funkiness to inkiness, especially in Syrah. It's become really a big deal, um, and it's like no other um, AVA is so particular and and so yeah, even in all of America, Mary, don't you think? Like yeah, oh, in the, the world, difference between really, Washington and, Sur and, and California Syrah is night and day. Yeah, and, and and it's so so they pull up. So this was all riverbed area. So we're talking like these stones, like big you know stones that probably go at least you know ten feet under you know below ground, and it's and it's been riverbed rock for you know um, for years, and it just has been a perfect growing entity, but also very difficult to work on. Uh, as you can imagine, and and different vin and different techniques as far as how you're growing your vineyards there and such, but I love the fruit from there, and I've um, started working with um, Stony Vine two years ago, uh, and I've, and really learning so much because I've not dealt with that kind of vineyard and what to deal how to deal with the the fruit um, is unlike any other. So I'm excited. Nice. Anybody else have any questions? further for Mary or we'll let her go and get a big steak and finish that cab. All right. Well, I, um, it was so enjoyable. I hope you guys, I hope I shared something with you. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Let's everybody give cheers. cheers. Thank you, Mary, Thanks, for Mary. joining us. It was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Support. Well, come visit us. Okay. When you can, when we can all get over this drive on over. Okay. Nice. Sounds good. Absolutely. Yeah. Cheers. So tonight, tomorrow night, you guys, you already have the wines. I might have messed up. I, somehow I ended up with one extra of the wines and missing one of another wine. So I don't know. It's hard to get good help during this coronavirus thing. So you got to put up with the owners being in charge. So anyway, tomorrow night we have, uh, I think it's going to be really fun. We haven't met him. We've talked to him. I've emailed him. It's an importer. He's one of the owners of the company. It's called Vintage 59. It's out of uh, Maryland, I think, or Virginia. Anyway, back east, and they import. They started with all French wines, and now they're doing some Italian. Um, he is going to join us and talk about a, a grape called Dolcetto, and it's from the town of Alba in Piedmont, Italy. And we are going to recommend a pairing tomorrow of gnocchi and a red wine, a red sauce, and maybe some Italian sausage. Uh, Dolcetto, in my understanding, and I've asked him, but he hasn't answered yet. Dolcetto was always called the peasant wine when I visited um, Piedmont area. And Barolo and Barbaresco are called the king of wines and the wine of kings. And when you go to, uh, to, to Piedmont, what they do is they, they pour it out of a barrel into a carafe and they come to your table. And it's the true table wine of Italy. And that's what we're going to do tomorrow. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And I hope you're still having fun. And I hope everybody's safe and happy and thank you so much for supporting us mark over now mark yes 
question on the gnocchi. Are you, are you suggesting a potato gnocchi or a ricotta cheese gnocchi? Potato. Okay. That, that's what I understood, right? Okay. Thank you. Good we'll send an email tomorrow finishing, finishing up the uh, oh, that's recipe. Okay. He, hopefully he'll get back to me in the morning. Perfect. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Cheers.